There's a, an awful lot of news in the news, if that's possible, so we're going to get right into it. May Brussel to discuss and enlighten and uh, raise questions. Mainly, you raise a lot of questions that never seem to have answers until, well, they do. Weeks Cute later, it. a few weeks later, the answers come or out. a year later, yeah. Or a year later. So there's a lot happening, a lot happening with the, uh, the Watergate affair, as it is being called, and a lot happening with Arthur Bremer, yeah. which may also be the Watergate affair, <laughs> you don't know. Uh, May James uh, Ray, yeah. James Ray, why uh -huh. don't you uh, pick a point and start? Okay, should we tell them what cons dialogue assassination is? Dialogue conspiracy. Dialogue conspiracy. Okay, let's tell them what, the, what okay. that is. Well, for those who haven't been listening for uh, a long time, for a steady year, or haven't listened before, dialogue conspiracy uh, came on the air to explain the conspiratorial process of the United States mainly done through assassination. I'm a research worker in political assassinations, starting with the death of John Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Robert Kennedy, the Sharon Tate massacre, the Oda family massacre, the Wallace shooting. I follow political assassinations. Who is affecting the course of elections? Because every one of these things um, affects elections. Did you notice in the paper this week, Phil, there was an article that there's a pattern of prison riots at the same time that there's ghetto riots, and they happen during election years? And I said these are provocateurs. There was a very astute resume this week that there seems to be a wave of pattern that comes at certain years where prisons and, and ghettos and minorities riot. And many times on the show we talk about the provocateurs that are put there for electoral purposes like Adolf Hitler did to get law and order. And uh, I sent a letter to various gentlemen up at San Quentin and said, lay low if they want you to cut your hair, cut it, obey, say yes, sir, because they're going to provoke a lot of riots the month of August while the Republican convention is going on. And I sort of laid out this blueprint. And this, and this was happening about a month ago. That I was talking about these riots, and there's been a rash of prison riots since that time, since that letter and message went out to them up there at the prison in San Quentin, because that's the only one where I have friends that I know of. Um, but I would like, you know, to be able to sell, tell all of them, don't fall for their game. Don't get worked up. The, uh, the, the word provocateur came up uh, from, uh, from Santa Cruz. It was mentioned uh, in a Santa Cruz County grand jury report uh, into the uh, the violence and the demonstration last um, May. That's right. The anti-war demonstrations and the county grand jury, although they didn't say uh, whether the provocateurs were organized or not. Or hired. Or people. hired. They did say that it appeared that there were provocateurs involved in the... Uh, Meaning not regular students. That's right. People that, that were urging people on to violence. And, and the law enforcement in Santa Cruz got mad and said... You didn't put it, the the college there didn't blame the students that you know the responsibility should have come down on those terrible young people today who are riding in the streets. This is what the law enforcement officials wanted, but the decision of the grand jury was that people outside the college community were provoking situations along with the policemen doing violent acts, and it wasn't the student body. Well, we've been on the air uh, just 14 months, once a week on dialogue, conspiracy, and assassination, and. At that time, um, just as a five-second review, when the Pentagon Papers broke, I said that America had one big problem, one big belch to get out, the really big problem that the Pentagon Papers uh, revealed that we don't tell the truth, our public officials, that deception is carried along the line. There was no real plan for the Vietnam policy, um, and uh, we planned the removal of DM just like I know we did many heads of states, including the ones in our own country. And at that time, I said um, conspiracies were not a popular subject at all. They weren't in the news. But this week, I brought in, it's one year later, and I brought in a pile of articles, and we'll just have to skim through them, on the Sirhan case in Los Angeles, James Ray, Jim Garrison in New Orleans, and Clay Shaw, and the Watergate elect connected to the electoral process again. And the news is just filled with conspiracy and assassination murder cases. Well, uh, while we have yet to begin on the specifics, uh, let me bring up another article, too, because in programs past you've mentioned Greece and the United States' involvement in Greece, and now the uh, uh, premier, the uh, dictator, or whatever you want to call him in Greece, has uh, 
just simply asked his whole cabinet to uh, resign. He said goodbye to them. Yeah, yeah. Um, how does that fit in with things? Have you analyzed that well, situation it, in Greece there? It, yeah, oh, yes. I follow Greece very closely. And uh, the story that I did, the Watergate affair that is being distributed in across the country now that from the realist that uh, we'll give you the address in a few minutes, that Paul Krasner published mentions, the relationship of Greece and the overthrow of Greece and the selection of Spiro Agnew. The, the reaction to the article so far, a uh, few people have read it, and it's in the hands of people that's moving on now to the news media. Every, you know, the uh, various members of the Senate and Congress be distributed you know, by tomorrow to a lot of them. Was there's no the, if this article is real, then Nixon has to be impeached as well as Agnew, and that's what I want. I want the vice president running with Richard Nixon, who was selected by the Greek military junta, removed from the candidacy in the next few weeks. I brought in, and this fits in with the conspiratory uh, aspect of it, because uh, Agnew is a conspiracy. He was put on us by a police state. He is not a Republican as such. I don't consider him a Republican as such. And Life magazine had an editorial last week. They came out with an editorial about not having Agnew as vice president, and they followed it up with another one, and that they didn't want him as president. The L.A. Times had two editorials that didn't want Agnew as vice president. And Life this week had an article by you, Sidey, um, on the complacencies now of the um, Republicans, that they're just about a shoe in it, and it goes in that the next four weeks, they say, will be critical ones, but... Um, it looks like Nixon has everything going for him. He's got Labor and John Conley and the Texans, and he let Jimmy Hoffa out. He was paroled, and he has a Soul City going for Floyd McKissick and the Jewish support because of Israel. And then it's unless something goes off, um, unlike the disaster of Culloden, that was a battle in Scotland, the McGregors this time will stand on a victorious field. That's Clark McGregor who took over John Mitchell. Um, position with the committee to re-elect Richard Nixon. It'll be interesting to see in the next two weeks what Life magazine has to say about Agnew and Nixon when some of this information comes out about Greece and Spiro Agnew. I followed the shuffling of the cabinet out there. I read today that Peru was becoming a total dictatorship with no freedom of the press. We're lining up total fascist countries against the communist bloc side by side. And um, I, I, as long as we're on the Watergate article, just briefly, I'm jumping around. There was an article this week in the paper that um, it just briefly mentioned. It didn't mention the names in the Mercury, but it mentioned on the television last uh, week, during the week, that the accounting office, the general accounting office, and this is part related to Congress, will audit the finances of President Nixon's campaign because of possible links to the break-in at the Democratic Party headquarters that money, um, there was money from Marie Stan, Secretary of the Treasury, and John Mitchell, part of the committee to reelect Richard Nixon. The money from that group, uh, the committee, the $25,000 of it that was earmarked for the president's campaign fund was found in the pocket of Bernard Barker when he was arrested at the Watergate Hotel. And the newspaper said this is the first time that the bugging incident was related to the campaign finance law that, you know, that uh, they were supposed to uh, register a certain amount of money up to a date, and the rest would be made public. And um, that date was April the 7th, and supposedly this money was pulled out of the bank on April 25th. So they're going to trace. that. This is the door open that, that could remove Richard Nixon and Spiro Agnew. It's right through the Watergate door. But last night was the first acceptance of the major news media on all the networks of the money related from the Republican committee to the um, uh, Watergate incident and the men arrested. But I wrote an article for three weeks. They were arrested on June the 17th, and the article went to the printers July the 11th, and the whole thing relates them to the committee, and the news has failed to face what was happening for one month. This is August the 2nd, and finally on August the 1st, they say, well, there's a link. You know, nobody could figure out why John Mitchell resigned. They could have found the link, just like they could find who shot Governor Wallace. We'll go into that in a second. 
But they're a little slow at doing things like you say. We talk about it, and it'll come in later because we've talked about this for three weeks now, and it'll be coming in. Uh, there was another article on the bugging incident and Nixon's aid being linked um, to the Watergate Hotel, which was interesting. And this is one of the most important articles, too, to come out because a man who works, who was in charge of the committee reelect Richard Nixon, the lawyer, the head lawyer for the whole committee, Telephone calls were coming to his phone from Bernard Barker from Miami. But the important thing is that Charles Colson, who is in the White House, who supposedly hired one of the men, Howard Hunt, in the White House, who the arrested men had his name on their pocket when they were arrested, Charles Colson and Al Wong, Al Wong is from Secret Service, and he was supposed to have hired one of the men who was arrested to be chief of security at Miami at the time of the conventions. Charles Colson and Al Wong have been given an attorney by Richard Kleindance of the Justice Department. The, the Attorney General of the United States has, has given them an attorney, Mr. Goldblum, to represent their d defense in the case, and he's prosecuting the case. The same Justice Department, the Attorney General that replaced John Mitchell, is prosecuting the Watergate affair and he's sending the lawyers for the defense. That's uh. Now, I don't, doesn't sound right. Does it? No. Um, lawyers that I've spoken to just. On what basis is he supplying the defense attorneys? Well, what I'm trying to point out, Phil, on this program, and I try hard every week, is to say that we have a actual dictatorship that kills the opponents in an electoral year, or else intended to overthrow the government this year. You know, and that. When you talk about Greece, it's easy to look way over there and say, well, the premier shuffles his cabinet without any concern. That's what we do. We pull people in. We, we don't have any say over who our cabinet is. Uh, Nixon's had the biggest shuffle of people of any president. They walk in and walk out with no excuse. It's just like John Mitchell sits down for one job and steps out of another where he's directly linked to a, a criminal case here. But the Justice Department, and I've tried to say this for a long time, does not represent finding justice we can go into this now with the arthur bremer case where it's so obvious how the fbi who i know not only was in on the whole planning and thing but is letting bremer go their whole prosecution uh, from the fbi and the main witness said bremer didn't even hold a gun or no proof they did we'll go into that but the point is on the watergate story that the justice department the attorney general is sending the lawyers to defend to the men and he's sending he's doing the prosecuting well, how does he justify, again, sending, you know, Justice Department attorneys to defend them? Uh, is it because of their positions in the White House? He justifies it. Well, he, no, he has to take this because it involves the White House. There's no civilian lawyer that knows the mischief the White House is into. There's no one that knows what the White House has done for the last 20 years. And there's no one in the last 10 years that I have studied that, that has any idea how Richard Helms the CIA or Richard Nixon or John Mitchell run this country. Now, and they can't send in. Uh, he says there'll be no conflict of interest. He was asked, is there a conflict of interest? He says, no, because we won't let our criminal department see what the civil department's doing. They, you know, they're just about a, a hair's breadth away. Well, the military also pr provides both sides. That's right. Military cases and, and Billy Smith's case, although Billy Smith has one civilian defense attorney. Um, well, I question that. He has that. Two, two military defense attorneys and two, uh, two military uh, lawyers are prosecuting him. Yeah. So it does happen in the government. Well, I'd have to know more about Luke McKissick because of... Luke uh, McKissick is the attorney for I know. He's civilian what you attorney. Call a civilian. I'm just trying to clarify. I'm trying to clarify whether he's still military. You see, the men that work for the Warren Commission, the lawyers that work for all of the assassination cases like Percy Foreman or F. Lee Bailey are military lawyers. They just wear street clothes, but they work for the military, and only the military case. Any proof of that? Well, I have a, a documentation from lawyers in the Southwest that every trial lawyer that comes in on the assassination cases is signed from Muscle Shoals, Alabama. And I don't have the linking of McKissick to that, but I have, we'll go right into the, after we do the Wallace today, we'll go into the Sirhan, and I'll show you the kind of evidence that Luke McKissick allows Sirhan to sit on uh, at San Quentin with. At first it was death row, now it's commuted to life in jail. 
where the case would be overturned. If another, if he could have the attorney he wanted, I'm sure it could be overturned, because he's tried to get him, and they won't let McKissick off the case. And that's another way, you know, that they're assigned because you can't fire them; they just sit there. You can't, you can't get rid of them. About the Watergate affair, Mary, may before we leave it completely, do you think that uh, that the Watergate affair, the fact that uh, the Republicans are uh, being tied in the White House, specifically? is being tied to the break-in at Democratic headquarters in Washington, D.C. Do you think that's going to eventually have a, a great effect on the election, or do you think that eventually I, it's going to be explained away and covered up? Well, about four people who saw the advanced copies of the Watergate affair story that I did said, it, I, well, I don't like to put it in grandiose terms. Wait and see. Let, let's let them... Their reaction was... Um, that it was just unreal, that if this was true, of course it would affect the elections. But then I used to have a fantasy that I could stop the elections in 1972 on the basis of all the information I had, that if we could get it to the people, um, there w it would be possible to have Congress halt them and examine all the candidates and get that funding out and find out if uh, Richard Nixon is a clandestine agent and not a Republican, and if Agnew is selected by a clandestine group and not the Republican Party. See, these men don't go to any Republican meetings. They don't have to campaign on the streets. They do. The excuse is violence, but they don't relate to the Republican Party. When Nixon wanted to uh, decide in 67, it went to the law office in, in New York, and John Mitchell was at another law office, and their offices merged. And Mitchell and Nixon had a meeting, and um, it was decided that John Mitchell would run Nixon's campaign. And then Nixon told all the Republican governors that came to him, don't see me. Don't, I don't want to see you. You're to contact John Mitchell. You know, Well, a man who has lost for the Senate in California and who's lost for um, governor of California and wanted the office so badly in those years would welcome any Republican governors who want to see him because this is how you run campaigns. You don't throw the Republican governors away. But he referred them all to John Mitchell. Then John Mitchell goes to Congress and, and to speak to about 15 Republicans in the House. And, and he met them, and he says, I'm John Mitchell. I'm going to manage Richard Nixon's campaign. You're going to want to see me, but you can't see me because I'll reach you, and you may not like what I'm doing. This is, in fact, what he said, but we'll get this thing on, and he'll win. And when you're ready, I'll, I'll meet with you. You won't be able to see me. That's not the way you run a campaign in the United States if you want the high-ranking Republicans in the country. So so you, know, you don't think that the, uh, the last of the Watergate affair has been heard yet? Oh, Phil, <laughs> uh, please. <laughs> let, let us see. I've got to ask. <laughs> I don't know. You evidently haven't read it yet, or you wouldn't ask that question. Well, I've, I've been doing this show for so long, you could recite it. Uh, no, you know the funny thing is that we've been doing this show on. Well, here. I mean, I've I've listened to this show, uh, you know, and and been on the show for a long time, and uh, it's having a great effect on people, in in the area that the station covers. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I mean, I have read the article, <laughs> and uh, I happen to think, you know, personally, that the article has some incredible things to say, which if picked up by the right people, could really uh, knock a few people over, but. Uh, you know, the fact that the article is written and the fact that I believe that... Uh, Doesn't that mean that they will. Right, and that's why I ask you... Uh, well, I have a few things going in my favor with the article, and that's this, that a, a lot of good books have been done about the assassination, a lot of evidence of conspiracy has been put out. But the things that I have going are several factors. In the first place, Richard Nixon said, please don't pursue the suit because it'll damage me, so he knows it's important. The second thing is that John Mitchell resigned because of the Watergate, so it's explosive. And the third thing is that Martha Mitchell is still an actual prisoner, and you get a lot of women's lib or human interest people wondering well, what really happened to her. She isn't with her child, and no one hears from her, and she's a physical prisoner who's been injected and, and locked away. You know, like, like she's a criminal. All she has done is seen a crime committed, and they've locked her away, which means that we're all capable of being you know, administered the same treatment at any moment. So because there's a woman involved and because John Mitchell quietly slipped away, like the Washington Post had an article last night saying that 
uh, Larry O'Brien came out and said it was perfectly obvious because of the links of the telephones and the connections of the people arrested at the Republican Committee that John Mitchell didn't resign because of his wife wanting him at home. Well, you know, the article goes into that at great length, you know. Uh, she wanted him to be in the Justice Department. She didn't mind his long hours. She just didn't want to be witness to a crime. And they also could go to jail for it if they harbored criminals because one of the men arrested was employed by him. You see, so you've got all of these things happening. And then besides the, the woman's interest story, the suit pending, which Nixon knows will hurt it, and all of the press isn't for Nixon. If, if uh, all of the press that's for McGovern publishes a part of this story, then the Nixon people will print it because it sells, not because they want it. They print a lot of good stuff on, on all these things, conspiracies and assassination, because they're there to make money. Besides, then, I mentioned before, if Life and Time are, and L.A. Times are actually afraid of Agnew, and I think he should be re impeached and reinvestigated, then why wouldn't they grab the story if, that, if the documentation is there? They've already said what they think about him, that he's a danger. They imply he's a danger to the country. He's dividing and so forth. So adding all those things up and giving enough documentation, um, I think we'll get some action. We'll, we'll see. Okay, yeah. then we'll, we'll be moving on to uh, an equally involved story concerning, uh, I see, Arthur Bremer. Yeah, we'll, there have been late developments in that. Uh, you know, for weeks we were talking on these shows about uh, Oswald and Ray and Sirhan and uh, the other assassinations. And then when Wallace was shot, there was a lot of interest at the studio. Remember, people called up and they wanted to know what was happening, you know, with Wallace and was it a, a political assassination. And remember, we did the show on Saturday. He was shot on Monday, and I gave all the reasons why I thought it was a conspiracy. And in the following week... You also made a statement, if my memory serves me correct, which was fairly incredible at the time but it uh, seems a little bit more believable. And if my memory is right, you said that Arthur Bremer didn't shoot George Wallace. Well, I, it sounded incredible. Didn't and it? with the fact that it had been filmed by a CBS cameraman and had been witnessed by a crowd of people, and the fact that he had been captured immediately after the shooting, that seemed like a, uh, almost a, an insane statement to make. But <laughs> uh, some testimony in the trial makes you wonder about that. Well, you that. know, this is the same kind of thing after I'd been working on the John Kennedy murder for so many years, and then uh, Sir Han killed Robert Kennedy, and there was certain evidence coming in on that, and, and and then when I realized and mentioned the man who is suspected of shooting him, Thane Caesar, from the back of the head, and the autopsy said one inch from the back of the head, and, and I was communicating with my family in L.A., talking on the phone, and my mother said, she wrote me a letter, May, now you've really flipped, you know, I mean, you've done the Oswald thing, but Everyone knows of that dirty little, and then she goes into all these ethnic excursions and, and criticisms of that little runt, you know, from, from that place, you know, way over there and all. You know that he did it, and if everybody saw it, then you, you know, you are blowing your mind because you're so much into conspiracies that you can't keep your head straight. Well, I brought in an article that was published this week on the destruction of the right arm of the coat of Robert Kennedy also. This is new material for me. The left shirt and coat sleeves and the cuffs links have been thrown away. Uh, they were cut off of his coat. And we'll go, I don't want to jump around too much, but the evidence on the tampering of, of Robert Kennedy's coat and the bullets and the guns and so forth, and the 10 bullets there, and Sirhan's gun only shot eight. I didn't say at the time that Bremer didn't shoot him. What I said was, uh, and, and I said it right off the bat because I can add to, I can still add to eight, you know, and I'm lucky if I can do that these days. I said that there were five shots in Governor Wallace. The New York Times had pictures in the doctor's report. There were five shots that they admitted in Governor Wallace. Now it seems that there were many more. But there were three people at the shopping center that were also shot, a woman and a man and another guard who had six hours surgery. And it seemed that two people were put in the hospital that day and just thrown out and played down, and nobody knew how bad they were hurt. But one of the women came to the trial. Yes, the one woman came. She's still on crutches and her leg in a cast, and she's in bad shape. So she obviously needed a lot of medical care, but they whisked her out of the hospital that day to not make a thing. But there were three people at the shopping center that were shot, and five bullets in Wallace, and nobody mentioned that the three people were directly behind Wallace, which was similar to the, like, uh, there was a diversionary again, and like the Ambassador Hotel, and, and, 
and Bramer yelled out something like, hey, where does he come by, or something like that, those effects. There was this diversionary, and there were eight bullets, three people injured, you know, seriously, and Wallace had five, and they weren't standing behind him, and it was a five-gun revolver. Uh, computer and automation came out just this month with what I was adding up, you know, back in May at the time of the shooting. In July 1972 has an article on the shooting of presidential candidate George Wallace, and it goes into the New York Times article of the five-bullet capacity of the gun that Bramer had. Then it goes into the bullets. One bullet passed through the upper arm and another through the right forearm, and one or both of two wounds in his chest could have been caused by bullets through the arm first. Well, it would be hard to you have to see where his arm would be, that he has two holes in the chest, and one in the right shoulder, one in the left shoulder. Then he had a bullet in his stomach, and he that's the one that is causing all the trouble and drainage because it broke his intestine, and the waste matter got all inside of his stomach. We talked about the serious surgery he had. Then they couldn't do the bullet on the spine that lodged in his spine because the stomach surgery was so serious, and he had the shoulder and the two arm bullets. But the stomach one was really the serious one. And then the doctor's report came out May 17th talking about two superficial wounds in his back and another one in his abdominal cavity. Well, that added up to eight inside of Mr. Wallace, and there were three more people. So computer and automation finds that they have 13 from 11 to 13 bullets. If his arm is over his chest, then they have 11 bullets. Otherwise, there's 13. So they said, what happened to the bullets? Nobody has connected the bullets to the gun that Brammer had. And we'll go into the the removal of Brammer to the Maryland jail and how the prisoners objected to the special treatment he was getting. But we could jump right to the trial this week. Choosing the jury took one hour. You know, That's pretty quick. That took one hour. The prosecution met uh, Monday, t uh, Tuesday rather. The prosecution was through in one day. But... The prosecution was a bunch of psychiatrists who said he didn't know what he was doing. But then the defense went on, and Mr. Frazier, the same doc, the same FBI man that did the ballistics work for the Warren Commission, it said, I'm reading a quotation from the newspaper, the defense had neither admitted or denied that it was Bramer who pulled the trigger of the gun that wounded Walls, but widely published photographs showing him at the moment of the assault. <laughs> and afterwards, being subdued, two FBI experts acknowledged that they had been unable to find Bremer's fingerprints on the gun, and th this is exactly like all it, fingerprints on the gun, used in the shooting, and they were unable to trace the fired bullets to the gun and could not find powder residue on Bremer's hands. Now, sometimes I talk about Dallas in 1963, that there were no fingerprints of Oswald on the gun, there was no paraffin on the test on his cheek or hands. It was negative. Oswald didn't fire a gun, and people say, well, how is that possible? You've got 26,000 exhibits and FBI experts. This is the same Frazier who, that said there was no fingerprints of Oswald on the gun who's saying it here. And he, he's having a trial. The, the prosecution ended yesterday. Now they're on the defense. They chose the jury in one hour. If This isn't a railroaded thing with head suspects changing license plates. They, for those of you who didn't hear the earlier shows, there was a, a suspect in Maryland that was changing his license plates. He weighed 220 pounds, six foot two, heavy set, dark fellow. A man up in Michigan, Milwaukee Ferry saw Bramer with two other men. One was 220 pounds, 225 pounds, um, uh, six foot two, dark complected. Bramer checked in at the Waldorf Astoria. There was no uh, discussion what floor he stayed on, who he stayed with, the Lord Elgin Hotel. He, I have information. He stayed at the same floor as a CIA agent. In, in L.A. they have his name. The one who stayed at the Lord Elgin Hotel He's with the CIA agent up in Canada when he was up there. Uh, now, this goes into the problem, again, which I mentioned in the article uh, two or three times, I think, that Patrick Gray III has not been appointed head of the FBI, and he should be removed from any nomination or from any office in the Justice Department. His first case after J. Edgar Hoover was killed <laughs> was, and this was to consolidate the CIA to take care of the Justice Department, uh, his first case 
was the Brammer case. And the second big case is the Watergate. Well, if the FBI found no fingerprints of, uh, of Brammer's on the gun and they had no bullet tracings, no bullets to prove, they didn't even find a bullet to prove that it matched the gun and no, par no um, tests on Bramer, then why did the FBI close the case? Okay, well, let's, uh, let's a answer that question or at least bring it up again after we identify the station and the program. This is Dialogue Conspiracy with political research specialist Mae Brussel. You're listening to it on KLRB FM Carmel, 24 hours. Long time, 14 months of weekly, hour-long programs. Yeah, that's a long time. It went fast. <laughs> yeah, it's going very fast. But everything, you know, like we talk about things on this show, and uh, almost every one of the things that I say that has documentation should be making a headline if it's true. You know, the, just the kind of information that's coming out, and the people in the community have absorbed it. But when I put it down in printing, then, you know, and begin to publish it, then it's, it's going to really make a lot of ripples. People have to sit and hold it and see it. Now, regarding the testimony of the FBI at the uh, Bremer trial concerning the fact that they couldn't find his fingerprints on the gun, that uh, they couldn't find powder <clears throat> powder burns on his hands, and they uh, couldn't trace the bullets that were found in, in Wallace to that gun that uh, Bremer was alleged to have had, uh, I've heard one explanation offered the uh, psychoanalyst Somebody who, one of the doctors that examined Bremer says that he washed blood off of Bremer's hands before the paraffin test was made. Well, they could wash the blood off the hands, but how do they count the bullets? And why can't they find the bullets? You see, when the bullet uh, was taken out of the back of Wallace, why didn't they match it to the gun that he was supposed to allegedly have if they're going to prosecute the case? So uh, you suspect that possibly there are uh, that although Bremer may have fired a weapon and may have indeed fired a weapon at Wallace and hit him, that there were others involved. Yes, well, the FBI, see, I'm accusing the FBI of planning the murder, uh, and I accuse them of, because I know what they did in the past murders, and I accuse them of not wanting to find evidence. You see, Bremer had a car, and the FBI didn't pick up that car. It had a gun in it, and the FBI examined that car really carefully and went through that car. But the car actually had a gun in it. And why wouldn't the FBI find it when somebody else can come along and pull a gun out of that car and never mention the fact of whether or not it matched those bullets? Um, you see, there, there's a report here. It's in computer and automation, and also it was in the, the newspapers, that Edward Walsh and Bob Woodward of the Washington Post, this is May the 19th, said the police in Prince George's County, Maryland, yesterday found a 14-shot semi-automatic pistol used as a military weapon in Bremer's car, and the local police discovered the 9 millimeter weapon after the FBI had thoroughly searched Bremer's 1968 Rambler, and there is no explanation of the FBI, which searched Bremer's car, failed to discover that second weapon. Now, the FBI is, is coming to the prosecution of the case, and I think follow this, like I say, the FBI has planned past political assassinations, and each of one of those, Nixon gained the votes. If Mitchell, if Wallace is killed this time, Nixon gets those busing votes up in Michigan, Maryland, and the South. Um, the FBI came in on the case to investigate it immediately. Bremer went to the hospital for stitches, and they called the White House. What should we do? And the White House says he can go and get medical care if the FBI accompanies him. And when he walked out of that hospital or treatment center, he was under the custody of the FBI, and the local police never had him again. But the local police searched his car. And uh, first the FBI then searched his car, and they found nothing. He had no gun. The car was searched by the local police. The local police found this weapon in the car. I'll go on to read more about it. Now, do you want to prosecute a case? The FBI send their gun expert to say he didn't have fingerprints on the gun. How do you, how does the FBI prosecute Bremer? They're letting him off. You see, if all the evidence is in his favor, the prosecution is saying there's no evidence he shot anybody. See, that, what kind of prosecution is that? Is that a conflict? I mean, figure that one out. But the computer and automation says uh, it goes into the 
traveling of Bremer in Milwaukee. He left his job February the 15th and went to Ottawa and stayed at that Lord Elgin Hotel and went to the Waldorf Astoria. And he bought guns, tape recorder, a portable radio with a police band. There was a radio with a police band in the killing of Martin Luther King, in the James Ray thing, in the John Kennedy, the, the band, you know, in the Tippett killing. There were police bands connected to all of these murders. No, the Sirhan didn't have a radio um, control. That He went right for the ambassador. There wasn't a radio band in there that I know of. There may be people around the ambassador who were in on it, but that didn't play. These other three had this radio band that goes, the police band on it. But um, then the FBI went around to everybody and told them not to talk. They instructed the FBI, in the case in Milwaukee and wherever he was, were don't talk. Now, you know, in the article that I did for The Realist, I mentioned a lot of funny coincidences. They're not funny. I just gave a few there, but in the research, there's always funny things because um, the bank that uh, he used, Bremer used Milwaukee, it's called the Mitchell Bank, the Mitchell Street Bank. I mean, that's in case he forgot where his money was at. It's at the Mitchell Street Bank. I thought that was funny. Like when uh, James Ray, the alleged killer of Martin Luther King, was down in Portugal. He went to the Dallas, there was a Dallas uh, bank down there, you know. Dallas, a bar in Portugal. And, but he's at the Mitchell Bank in uh, uh, Milwaukee. And the FBI went everywhere and told them not to talk. Well, it, the um, computer and automation said agents of the FBI who went to all possible sources and told them not to talk to newsmen, and such instructions by the FBI are illegal. Now, if they're illegal, they, this has happened in every one of these cases. That the FBI canvassed the whole town and said to everybody, if you've seen him with someone or you know something, don't talk to newsmen, don't talk, as if... You'll ruin our chance of investigating, and then they don't investigate, and the dumb people are left with the information. That's what happened down in Dealey Plaza when Mark Lane wrote his book about uh, Rush to Judgment. They told everyone not to talk, and they obeyed, and the Warren Commission didn't do anything, and he collected everyone who didn't talk, and they had all the information. The witnesses didn't have the information. So computer automation said instructions by the FBI are illegal and have no force of law. They can't arrest you at all for saying what you know. Furthermore, instructions are wrong in a democracy because they prevent the public from knowing what the public has a right to know. And it is regrettable that people take at face value misinformation they receive from the FBI. Now, this is what happened at the Watergate Hotel. The, the man who manages the hotel in Washington was told by the FBI, don't talk to anybody, don't talk to newsmen, the librarian at the White House. You can't talk to anybody, the Washington Post. And and there were direct links between what these people were doing and the people arrested. And they were shut up. So the Bremer uh, case went to trial. We were ending up with like 13, 11 to 13 bullets. And the case has gone to trial. They, they selected the jury in one hour. The prosecution, which said he didn't have a gun, lasted one day. The television this week made a disgusting statement. They said... The defense tomorrow will bring in his mother and father, and then you'll know that he's mentally deranged, you know, and that, that it was just a mental problem. As if a person from a lower economic class, the boy was spending thousands of dollars, um, they want to pass it off. There's another remark about the FBI uh, by a man who is going to be in charge of security for this four-day trial, <laughs> Mr. Ansel. Uh, in Maryland, he was he attended a conference on security down in um, Palm Springs, and he went to the Wax Museum where he saw a statue of Oswald being carried away by the sheriffs, and he visualized himself in Maryland, you know, being in the Wax Museum today carrying off Bramer, which is hardly going to happen. And he goes into the fact that it's very unusual that the FBI is taking care of the whole trial. He really won't have to do it. He says. Uh, although Ansel, I'm reading, this is from the Washington Post, uh, he says, although Ansel didn't admit it, the FBI will retain control of Bramer, even at the upper Marlboro courthouse, and have the ultimate responsibility for his safety. Now, it says, in the case of Bramer, however, the White House is known to have ordered the FBI, usually limited only to investigating to have complete custody of the suspect. Now, everything everything is unusual in these cases. You see, the FBI is going to have control of him. Their excuse being, we don't want to bungle what happened, like with Lee Harvey Oswald. 
You see how beautiful that was if they were in on the killing of Lee Harvey Oswald. Then they could control every other assassin because you kill the first one, the first patsy that you arrest, that you say did it, whose fingerprints weren't on the gun and didn't own a gun. You kill him because he said for two days I didn't kill anybody and there's no proof that he killed anybody. Then every other suspect who may be part of a conspiracy but didn't actually shoot the gun like James Ray or, or Sirhan who shot a gun but didn't do the fatal bullets. Or in this case, you get Bramer. And we keep adding these up. In, in all of these cases, the FBI says, no, I have to isolate you. Like, if I'm not going to kill you like I killed Jack Ruby and Lee Harvey Oswald, I'm going to isolate you because you may be killed like Oswald. So it's just a living death, no matter how you slice it. Nobody else gets to see them or let them tell people. Because, see, Oswald was alive for two days, for those of you who don't remember who Lee Harvey Oswald was, the alleged assassin of John Kennedy. And all the time he said he was innocent and didn't kill anybody, and then he was killed in the police department. So the FBI says, well, as long as Oswald was killed, nobody can see these men. You see, so the FBI is taking care of this place, and, and Mr. Ansel's saying, I won't have much to do with it. Now, what do you think of the FBI being the only ones to um, be in on the investigation for the state trial of Bremer? It's terrible. It's terrible. It, well, they did it in, when John Kennedy was killed in Dallas. The judge and the coroner's office blocked the hotel, the hospital. <laughs> Parkland Hospital, they said this is an ordinary homicide, we're going to do the autopsy, and they said, no, we're taking that to a military hospital. You know, they took it to Bethesda, Maryland, they grabbed the body and ran. That's Larry O'Brien, the body snatcher. Uh, they took that body and ran. I think it's terrible. I don't think that the people who are playing these things should be investigating them, even if they didn't plan them. The local people should be able to do all the ballistics, get into the area, and handle it themselves. And when the local people do it and the FBI doesn't do it, then they're CIA agents. I'll jump right to the L.A. Police Department, which is nothing but the CIA uh, is not even a civil police department for the most part. It's controlled for all these major conspiratorial cases. It investigates them, it helps plan them, and it investigates them. Uh, the one more thing about the, the Brammer thing, uh, Mr. Ansel said it, it now appears that during the trial, Bramer will live up in a special jail at Upper Marlboro Jail under the FBI guard, and the FBI was reluctant to ferry him back and forth in town, so they will stay with him. They will guard him. They investigated him. They closed the case when the gun had no proof. I mean, the FBI has to be investigated. I've said this for, well, I'm doing my research nine years, I've been, you know, writing to public officials for four or five years. The fact that it's coming to a head in the election year is too bad, but that's the way the cookie crumbles. It just It's all coming to a point. I've said, like Regan says, the next uh, election will determine the course of history for a thousand years in America, and I feel he's right. I know it will. This, this 1972 election, uh, if you vote for this kind of a police state, and that's what it is, uh, you don't have to believe me on the Dallas, you don't have to do research on the Martin Luther King or John or uh, the uh, Robert Kennedy, but just take Brammer that's happening today, this week, and read your paper, read the computer automation, and follow it yourselves if you don't want to go back, because this is so easy to see. Once I explain the, the blueprint of how the, they don't count the bullets, they don't match the bullets to the gun, they have no proof that he shot the gun, and... And he can get off. This was the agreement. See, Bremer is sitting with the same arrangement they promised Lee Harvey Oswald because he was uh, supposed to go to college in, September, in the fall after that assassination, that if he didn't own a gun and there was no proof that he did it, he could be arrested as a decoy. And then all the people who did the shooting and the crossfire were flown out of town with the assistance of the military. Then when Oswald went to trial, he would be free because there'd be no proof he did it. And that worked for Oswald, and it may work for, it didn't work for Oswald because then they killed him two days later. But maybe, it's funny that the script was written, according to extensive research, which I do every day, every week, and, you know, continuously, that, the way it lined up, and I'm going to someday write a book called Decoy into Patsy, how you hire a man, what his associations were, his funding, his connections, and then how you turn him into a Patsy and make him the man responsible for the crime and who actually did it, the roles that switch. Well, it obviously seems that Bremer uh, is decoy for a silencer or a second gunman, and that, that on the condition that he doesn't talk, he'll be 
he'll probably get off. Brimmer did a lot of traveling before the uh, oh, it's Wallace attempted assassination, and he spent some sums of money. And as he said, he stayed in a very ritzy uh, oh. New York hotel. Well, yeah. Uh, any has there been any uh, explanation as to where he got the money? Absolutely no. That's what what's so horrendous about it is that Patrick Gray doesn't. You know, the acting of the FBI has not said what Flory stays on the wall or whether he had one room and there were two people in it or whether there were two people or the three that he was with in Michigan. They don't want it. They don't have to explain anything. That's the thing. They're investigating and they're closing it. There should have been an all-out search for the second gunman if this is August and they knew in June, in May, that his fingerprints weren't on the gun. And then even if the FBI mistakenly missed that gun that the police found, did any of the bullets match that gun that were slipped into his uh, car? And then he's made responsible. Uh, now we're going to go on, if I can get past that noise in the other studio <laughs> that they're making. Uh, uh, yesterday, the court said that uh, Jim Garrison could not prosecute Clay Shaw. Uh, that was decided that he could not uh, bother that poor man anymore. Jim Garrison arrested C Clay Shaw uh, for being part of a conspiracy to kill John Kennedy, that he knew Lee Harvey Oswald and David Ferry, and that Clay Shaw was an important link in New Orleans to the John Kennedy assassination. And the main witnesses that, Clay, that Garrison would have had fled to California, Texas, and Ohio, and were never extradited, and the others were offered juicy promises and bribes, you know, to not help Jim Garrison with the case. So the jury could not convict on a conspiracy. They could not convict him for being responsible for the entire conspiracy or a conspiracy to kill John Kennedy. So Garrison slapped a charge on him the minute the trial was over for perjury because Clay Shaw said he didn't know uh, Lee Harvey Oswald and he didn't know David Ferry. Well, David Ferry was killed by a karate chop about one day after Clay Shaw was arrested. And David Ferry was a very important link to the assassination. Also, the men arrested at the Watergate Hotel. One of the men arrested at the Watergate Hotel was, was brought in and questioned by the FBI because of an assassination plan to kill John Kennedy in Miami and his relationship to the whole group. So the... Um, uh, David Ferry was dead, like Lee Harvey Oswald and Jack Ruby. It's hard to have a trial like that. You know, they all are lopped off. And and right away, Jim Garrison knew about 21 people that had seen Clay Shaw with Ferry or Oswald. So he slapped a perjury trial. Well, the United States court blocked it and said, you can't have a perjury trial, and they just threw it out. The reason is that it persecutes Clay Shaw. Now, Clay Shaw is linked into the Galen operation and into the infiltration of Nazis in America and to the uh, fascist organizations in uh, Spain, in, in Spain and Italy and England through the International Trade Mart in New Orleans. And uh, Those are very broad statements to make. Yeah, well, if this thing opens up in Congress, uh, Nixon's funding will go all the way. It will go for every mileage. It, it could go on for a year or two. People could sweep in with all the documentation, including myself, within a minute. And, and put it there. You know, I've stood by everything I've said on this program. You know, I, I challenge anybody, any time, incidentally, if, if you are an old listener or a new listener and you want to challenge my statements and uh, you don't, you may not like them and you may not agree with them because you don't like what I'm saying. But if you want to challenge anything that I'm saying and prove me wrong, I, I would welcome the chance to have a, a discussion with you there's no one in the nation who can defend the Warren report, and there's no one who's met a researcher that would have a public debate on the evidence. So we'll go. Okay, they can write the station or write you care of the station, or f best thing is to write, or, either, or they can phone the station, yeah. leave a message. Maybe we better take a break and give the address for the realist because the copy's right. on, a, on the peninsula, and Paul's going to run out of... Uh, he, they're going to go pretty fast. He'll keep printing as many as they want, you know, but uh, he's giving a few thousand away to get it started, you know, and then the others are going out by subscription only, and we'll, I'll leave some off at the Odyssey. I hope they'll cover them, carry them, but if you want to subscribe and get it in the mail the next few weeks, it's uh, in Care of the Real is 595 Broadway, New York 10012. It's $3 for the year, and you'll get your $3 worth in the first 
yeah, first article. Yeah, a good three dollars worth of reading. Nine There's also reading. some very entertaining. Oh, uh, the articles are fantastic. The other articles. You like that cartoon about Rose America? Rose America. Yeah. There's yeah, a, a, a. So it's worth three dollars. You could pay three dollars for that one issue and not feel cheated. Yeah. Paul's done a, a cartoon with the um, uh, artist from Mad Magazine called Rose America's Baby. An insert in the realist, and the uh, Rose America is a Statue of Liberty, and she gives birth to Siamese twins. She says, "No wonder it hurts too much, and I'll nurture both until one kills the other one off." And then, after that cartoon, it breaks right into my story of that we have two governments, one hidden, one concealed, and one in the open, and they're killing each other. They are fighting each other off, and that's exactly. It, I think the cartoon is just a stroke of genius. It's really a far-out cartoon. And uh, it's great, but well, and again, we should say that the, the realist contains the article on the Watergate that you wrote, and uh, a couple of other articles, oh, right? Yeah. yeah, the creation of the false motive, and then how Nixon came to pre be president. It's all, it's all one thing, really. No matter how you you take it, it all ties. It should all tie together. You know, if you can't see the connections by the time you're through with those three. We'll give you three more in the next month. <laughs> okay. Well, this week, uh, the court said that, that Jim Garrison was persecuting um, Clay Shaw. Uh, a lot of people say to me, what's happened to Jim Garrison? And we've done shows how the Justice Department, the same Justice Department that does a lot of other planning of evidence, uh, planted evidence against Jim Garrison and tried to discredit him and tried again to go to jail on a accepting money from pinball rackets machine. And, and he was cleared of those... The court hasn't cleared him yet of the charges, but there's no way to go to court. But a gentleman, Pershing Gervais, has surfaced and said that all this was planted by the Justice Department and paid by them just to discredit Jim Garrison uh, for what he tried to do. The Monterey Herald this week had a nice article about the case. It's from the uh, Associated Press. Yeah, from the Associated Press. And, and they said that Jim Garrison is a formally announced he'll be a candidate for the Louisiana Supreme Court. Uh, I tried to get the, the Democratic Party through contacts of people in San Francisco and in Washington if they were naming a vice president to name Jim Garrison. Because with the Watergate thing, see, all of those boys that were arrested relate to what Jim Garrison was saying when he arrested Clay Shaw. And Jim knows all about the troops, the ex combatantes and the Bay of Pigs and the people who wanted to kill Kennedy and the banking. And he could open up the truth for this country and that's the man I would like to see president someday. But uh, let's, it, let's move on to the okay. Kirschke article. Oh, okay, when uh, when because uh, we mentioned it already once. We just have about five uh, minutes. About seven minutes. Okay, when Sirhan was arrested in the Ambassador Hotel, and they say, "What's your name? And uh, how old are you? Where do you live?" And he wouldn't answer for any of the questions. But all he kept saying to the police department was, "Do you know Jack Kirschke?" And that seemed to be a key word, like, don't beat me up or don't cut me because I'm one of you boys. And it seems that the Jack Kirschke case was investigated by a criminalist by the name of D. Wayne Wolfer, a forensic chemist named D. Wayne Wolfer, who later was to investigate the Sirhan case, and he tampered with the evidence in both cases, and he turns out that he hardly has any certification, like the coroner in L.A., and... And there's a case coming up now to open up the Kirschke case. That's it. Jack Kirschke is a deputy district attorney who was accused of murdering his wife and her lover in 1967. And there's a 190-page document now which charges um, Dwayne Wolfer, L.A. Police Department chief forensic chemist, with willful and perjurious testimony at the time of the Jack Kirschke case. And when this article came out this week about uh, Mr. Wolfer being questioned on the perjury. Again, in all day, there, all day there was a news blackout. The Kirschke case took the, uh, I'm reading for the Los Angeles Star now that covered the case, uh, when, at the time that he was accused of murdering his wife and his lover, it took as much space in the press as the Tate, La Bianca, and the Kennedy. But when Wolfer turns out to be accused of perjury and lying on the evidence of the case that it couldn't have happened the way he said it did, none of the news media picked it up. AP, UP, LA Times, only the lone LA Star picked it up. Well, that's like when J Garrison was framed, the AP, UP, Life and Time photographed him being carted away handcuffed. When Gervais said he was framed by the Justice Department, only the New Orleans State's item carried it. So you have the L.A. Star going, and it said there is a direct link, and this is where we go to Sirhan, if you don't know the name Kirschke. 
There are both direct and indirect links to the Sirhan Kennedy case, which should have made this case of considerable interest to the Associated Press or LA Times, particularly of the direct links in this case. Because the head of the Los Angeles Police Department Crime Lab, Delane Wolfert, testified as an expert in both these cases, and his testimony was crucial to the conviction of both Sirhan and Jack Kirschke. Barbara Blair, a Los Angeles attorney, said in May 1971 that Wolfer had violated the basic percepts of ballistics analysis in these two cases, and a third one also, Mr. Terry, of Sirhan and Kirschke, and an independent criminologist, Pasadena criminalist William Harper, who served as a defense expert in the Kirschke case. He represented Jack Kirschke in the defense, got interested in certain discrepancies, and after the trial, he went to examine the ballistic evidence. And then he went into the Sirhan case because he realized that Wolfer had really fouled up this evidence. And then when the Sirhan case came along, it was the same thing, and it was the same man working for the LAPD. So the forensic chemist went into the case. Now, there, in 19... I brought a copy here of a letter which I had. It was also mentioned in the Star. A criminalist by the name of Marshall Hoots in Trauma Magazine wrote a public article and a letter to Evel Younger about the Kirschke case and B. Wayne Wolfer. And he said, that, in effect, that you're ruining the credibility of research people and doing investigations. And he says um, that the job was done so poorly by Dwayne Wolfer in the L.A. Police Department that it's a discredit to the academic profession. And he said in his letter, I have no personal interest in the matter, but I have an academic concern in Wolfer's horrendous blunders in the past and those he will com continue to commit in the future if he's allowed his con present assignment. See, Dwayne Wolfer was about to be promoted as the head criminalist again in civil service this last year, and it was held up because he fouled the evidence and, on the prosecution that convicted Sirhan and Jack Kirschke that didn't even fit the basic precepts of, of criminology. So it was held up, and then they begged him, various criminalists, and I have a list of, of affidavits and declarations of famous people who have done forensic chemistry and so forth, begged him not to promote uh, Wolfer to a position, and Evel Younger did it on March 24th this year. He made Dwayne Wolfer chief criminalist again, and and these people had written a letter saying that that the evidence in the case should be straightened out. And they go into uh, they say that Wolfer misrepresented the evidence in the case, and he didn't use. He said that he had had anatomy courses, and they went to the chairman of the anatomy department, at USC. And the, the teacher, Dr. Paddock, said it's false. It's not true. It's contrary to my personal knowledge that he took these courses. See, in L.A., we had Brian Stewart, the coroner, saying justifiable homicide of ripping off people down in L.A., blacks and Chicanos. And uh, he turned out not to be a doctor or a lawyer. Now you have Duane Wolfer saying, I have certain credits and courses, and they're saying it's absolutely not true. You didn't have those courses. You see the pattern, Phil, running through this thing of, of phony credits prosecuting people on evidence that doesn't hold up and the scientific data examined and then they go into the, the question of, of the ballistics of the Sirhan case. If time's winding up uh, we'll go back to this uh, next week because I think it's really important. Also we'll get into the Kennedy uh, destruction of evidence you mentioned. Oh yeah, yeah. because well, they brought up the question, here's a list of questions, it's from the LA Star that they asked it, uh, an investigation of Mr. Wolfer and they asked him, it says, also missing, Mr. Wilford, uh, bullets were missing. The gun that Sirhan used was thrown away, and they couldn't find it. And they said, also missing somewhere were Kennedy's left shirt and coat and sleeve and cufflink. And uh, what about that? He said, well, to my knowledge, I wouldn't know where it is. They said, would your notes help you to re recall where those things are? And he said, well, there are photographs of the coat in its original condition. Now, see, this is what we have with the John Kennedy car. We have the car in its original condition, and the interior was destroyed. See, we've never seen John Kennedy's car. Well, they asked him questions. Uh, well, don't you have orders of, of where uh, the shirt sleeve would be or the cufflinks or the coat sleeve? And he says, well, no, I guess they're destroyed. We'll wind up now. We're out of time. Out of time. <laughs> Got to move. Okay. So well, by next week, we'll probably have uh, even more information to try and squeeze into one hour. Okay. Uh, it, it's a lot of information, but uh, I think you can all absorb it and 
not have the news media play down to you what's happening. We're trying to relate some facts. Thank you, May. This has been Dialogue Conspiracy, a public affairs presentation of KLRB News. If you have questions that you want answered on future programs or any comments, write Dialogue Conspiracy, KLRB, Box 3904, Carmel, California, 93921. I'm Phil Kogan. RB FM in Carmel. For you, friends, a complete price only to five hundred dollars An easy money payment to run a week, quite a week, and never on Sunday. I'll take it. I'll take it. I can't wait to get away from it all. With the economy in the state that it's in, we at the Sound Cellar felt that we should come up with a good stereo system that you can afford. We've put together the Kenwood 2120 receiver, the Girard 40B automatic record changer with the sheer M3D magnetic stereo cartridge and a pair of Creative 11 dual cone speakers. This perfectly matched stereo system sounds as good as the price, only $229. Separately, this system would cost over $350, so come down to the Sound Cellar now and save $126 on this good stereo system. The Sound Cellar, the very best in high...